This is Health Matters with Sipla. Anybody who's ever owned a computer, and I guess that's most of us these days, know that if you overload it or have too many tabs open at once, it stops working properly. And as it gets older, well, it doesn't perform quite as well as it used to now, does it? Now, our body's pretty much the same. As our body's computer, our brain can easily suffer the same fate. And just like that old laptop of yours, once in a while, it needs repairs. So how do we keep our brain healthy and functioning at an optimal level? Well, this week in Health Matters, I'm speaking to someone who might just be able to give us some answers. Timothy Maurice Webster is a best-selling author of four human and brand behavior books and host of the Brain and Brand Show podcast for the past six years. Of course, this is ranked in the top 20 in 17 countries. His skills include applying neuroscience and behavioral science to decision-making and increasing brain resilience and creative problem-solving. Timothy, welcome to Health Matters. Hey, it's so good to be here. Thanks a lot, bro. Uh, You've been talking about brain health on your podcast for a while now, and you're here to share seven simple ways that we can use to boost our brain's power uh, in order, of course, to have more resilience, creativity, and a greater capacity to bounce back. So I'm excited to have you here and to run us through these seven key things that we should absorb, we should listen to carefully uh, and apply to our lives and our brains. Awesome. Well, number one, I'd like to start with something super simple. I don't know when the last time you've gone into your, do you have a garden or a nature I or do. A park near you? Yes. Yeah. So I don't know if you've gone and just sort of spent some time barefoot uh, inside of uh, nature. I mean, there's a great study that shows it's called forest bathing. If you spend three straight days in nature, your cancer fighting T cells grow by up to 50%. Your ability to fight disease increases. Your immune system becomes supercharged by communing and making love to nature. And nature is one of our best friends when it comes to, you know, increasing our nervous system's capacity to deal with life. And so the first one is nature bathing. And I would say to anybody that find nature and commune in it. A lot of people who are working hybrid, working from home, they take calls Indian style, sitting with their legs crossed in nature because they've discovered that the anxiety regions of your brain respond differently when people are stressing you out. And when you get those crazy calls and people are stressing you out, there's no better place to deal with it than in nature. So that's number one. Number two is what I call the artifact. I had a neurologist on my show named Dr. Curdy Rancho. And we talked about Most people will tell you that they're not creative. You know, people who are creative really do own it. Um, But people who who don't see themselves as creative don't realize that life is a creative pursuit. And that when you are creating, it's very difficult to focus on anything else. So one of the exercises I do in some of my training is I get people to draw their face. And when they're finished, they're always surprised that it looks more like them than it does me. So the first thing I'll say is that if you decide to take your child's face and draw it or a flower or anything that you see around you, it's difficult to worry and stress about other things. And it's a meditative process and that meditation exercise. And one of the reasons why I suggest this versus telling people to go meditate is not many people can calm their mind just by going and meditating. But for those who want to start on that journey, this is a good place to start. Third thing is what I call design your second brain. And this is one of my favorites. I mean, this is a, you know, it's a bit of a tip from both behavioral science and neuroscience. When you put your keys in the same place every day, what you're doing is you're creating what we call a second brain pattern in your home. Mm. If you decide to put your Zoom clothes in the same place in the closet, you put your workout attire in the same place, in a separate same place, you align your shoes, you are designing brain patterns, a virtual conceptual brain patterns. Mm -hmm. And what this does is help preserve cognitive load. It helps you preserve energy in a way that you can use that same energy on creative pursuits or dealing with some of the challenges we have to deal with. Yes. And this is important. It's one of the reasons why Steve Jobs wore the same black shirt yes. all the time. Yeah, It's the reason why I wear the same type of stuff Me all too. the time. Me too. I'm exactly, look, look, yeah, I'm wearing a black top. 
this is, I've got a hundred of these <laughs> in my cupboard. And, and it, this helps when you're doing any kind of TV stuff because, because when we want to pick up stuff, they go, what were you wearing? I go, I can tell you what I was wearing. The same thing I wear in every single thing I like T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we, can, if we can figure out a way to create stuff like Steve Jobs, then we'll be on the- Yes, we'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there, there are other benefits to designing your second brain. At Google's offices, and I've, I've spent a little time there, yeah. the office in New York. And what they do is they use design, uh, second brain design strategies to help people attract to things that, that are going to be healthier. So, for example, the, because the brain is primarily trying to preserve energy unless there is an emotion, emotional reason not to. What's, what happens is, for example, if I put fizzy, nasty drinks at eye level, I'm going to be naturally drawn to those. But if I put it up really high and I put the healthier drinks at eye level, I'm much more likely to be drawn to the thing that's easier to access because I'm still preserving energy. Now, there will be times where you will leap up to grab the nasty thing, right? But at the end of the day, if you look at, on average... You look at over time, you will find, and this is really important. One of the things I found that, like I've taken these fiber supplements and at first I was putting them with other, you know, health supplements in my, in my cupboard and I would overlook it. I'd remember to do it every once in a while. Then I realized, actually, I've got this second brain design technique. Let me put it in a prominent place. And I never overlook it anymore. So that's a design feature. And I yeah. think it's really important that people realize that if you don't design these things into your life, yes. you will get preoccupied with other stuff. And do not over-determine your brain's ability to not get distracted. <laughs> it's, like, it's one of the key lessons in life. Something is going to happen. Yeah. Something is going to happen to take your mind away from the very thing you want to do to make yourself better. Yes. All right. Number four is I, what I call turn off your prefrontal. Have you ever had a moment where you're trying to problem solve, you're trying to figure out an answer to something, but the answer wouldn't come. But then all of a sudden, when you stop thinking about it, Spot the on. answer came. Bam, bam. You want it now, want it now, it doesn't happen when you relax. As soon as you, you're, you're not as tense, trying to force it out of yourself, you stop and you, 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 you kind of, you know, you don't need it right now. I think it'll come and bam, it comes to you. So let me give you the neuroscience of why that happens, okay? I love this. I love explaining people what is the technical reason why stuff happens. Yes. So do you have a pet? Do you have yes. a pet? Yeah. So no matter how smart your pet is, what type of pet do you it's have? It's a dog, a Rhodesian Ridgeback called Lexi. Yeah, and Lexi is really intelligent, I know. But no matter how intelligent Lexi is, Lexi is part of the brain, the prefrontal regions, the part of the brain that humans have that make us an evolved species, Lexi's prefrontal is not as evolved as ours. Right. And how does that play out and why does that matter? Now, Lexi, if you go and you get Lexi right now and you ask Lexi what she is, a she or he? She, it's a she. She, what Lexi would like to do for December holiday. <laughs> Lexi's brain is not going to go that far. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so that's the role of the prefrontal cortex. And that part of the brain is a constantly assimilating the future. Now, what happens is that part of the brain goes into a spin cycle. So when you're starting to literally solve a problem or think about something, the toxicity starts to build up, the intensity of that. When you stop and you invest in a little bit of me time, you go for a walk, you take a bath, you go for a spa treatment, or you invest a little bit into yourself and slow down, you slow down the spin cycle and the answers start to evolve from these extraordinary patterns in your unconscious mind, and which is where so many of the answers already lie. So on a very simple level, it's exactly yeah. what you said. When you slow down, anxiety, regions of the brain start to calm and things start to evolve. Wow. Number five is what I call do an emotional bank account audit. We have terms, unconscious terms, that will define the health of our relationship. Let's say, for example, you like cricket or rugby. I yes. like basketball. I like American football. If I try to force you to watch American football, you try to force me to watch rugby. These are going to be emotional withdrawals. And 
the concept of an emotional bank account is very subtle but extraordinarily powerful. If I don't listen and pay attention to your higher values and the hierarchy of your values and really understand what matters to you, it becomes difficult for me to make intentional deposits into your life. And so the strength of our relationship is going to be me being smart enough to go for your birthday, instead of me buying you a pink shirt, I probably should consider buying a black one. Because (laughs) on deposit, if I buy you a pink shirt, that's going to be an emotional withdrawal. Now, you may not internalize it consciously, but over time, yes. you will feel like an emptiness. And when I go to the ATM of Ryan's heart to try to make a withdrawal because I need a favor, it may come back insufficient funds because I've been making a lot of withdrawals, maybe not even realizing it. Yeah. And this is important because if you want to increase and keep your brain healthy and strong, that being able to do an audit on where the accounts in your life stand is very important. Mm. And whether it's Lexi, your dog, whether it is your partner, your colleagues at work, paying attention and actually giving a damn about their lives and what matters to them, whether they're going to go away for a week on a religious retreat, whether they meditate and do yoga. If you pay attention to that and you, for example, share a link to a podcast about yoga, To someone who loves yoga, that's an extraordinary deposit. I'll tell you a quick story, Ryan. When I, in level five, things were really tough for me because I live alone. All my family's back in the States. And I live on the 15th floor and I would just look out. And normally before lockdown, I can see the highway. It's buzzing. The streets is buzzing. And all of a sudden, because everything came to a halt, the highways were empty. And looking at the M1 being dead empty and looking at the cold streets of Johannesburg being frozen like a piece of gray art was very difficult for me because I'm very conceptual. And I, part of the reason why I stay on the 15th floor is I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to reenact my New York lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking out, hoping I'm in New York sometime. <laughs> but the point is that it was tough for me. And I found myself literally like really struggling. And I had clients withdrawing, pulling out left and right. No, work for yourself and you're in this creative world. You need contact. Yes. So I called one of my mentors and I I called one of my mentors and I asked for a phone number. And I didn't check on him. This mentor is a billionaire who makes an extraordinary impact in my life by getting me to think about leadership differently, think about values and the journey of values-based leadership. He gave me the number, but he stopped taking my calls for about six months. Sure. And it's because I made an emotional withdrawal by not checking on him. Wow. And I started to send him books. I started to, I wrote a handwritten note and I took a photo of it and sent it to him to check on him. And after six months, he called me back. He never said to me, what was happening, but I knew because I understand this idea of the emotional bank account. And so I would suggest to anyone listening to pay attention to where your accounts stand with people, people that matter, the people you collaborate with, the people you partner with, and ask yourself very bluntly, am I requesting too many deposits and not making enough of them? Wow. Wow. That's number five. Number six is hydration. How much water have you drank today? (laughs) I've done it. I've done a 10 kilometer run this morning. I've drunk, uh, had a good, and here's the amazing thing is I can feel when my body needs, and it's a weird thing because a lot of people don't feel when they need to have water, when they need to hydrate. I can feel my body, almost all the cells going, hydrate me, hydrate me. Yes, yeah. (laughs) Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about why what one of the benefits are beyond the feeling. Sure. So when you and I are trying to problem solve or trying to deal with some level of some challenge or trying to map our way through this complex life, what we're doing is trying to make sense of patterns. And when I start to think about your content, your podcast, I start to think about people in my network or potential sponsors, and I'm trying to solve. What I'm doing is I'm putting patterns together. And if the brain is not hydrated, then the supportive function 
are called alpha waves. The alpha waves help ensure the patterns come together quicker and with less effort, more of a flow state. Mm. So when you hydrate your brain, you boost alpha waves. If your brain is not hydrated, then what you're doing is that you're, you create, there's a lot of friction. And that toxicity and that friction makes it difficult. If you've noticed throughout this conversation, I haven't used a lot of ahs and ums. Mm. And it's not because I'm such a good speaker is that I hydrate my brain. Sure. And what's happening is I'm, I'm able to access the information quicker. And so I would say to anyone who's thinking about translating themselves and positioning their conversation, just drink more water. <laughs> you sound better. That's People brilliant. think you know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> But it is, there is something again, and it, 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 with water and coming back to your, your very first point about uh, getting your shoes off and just feeling grass, fresh grass under your feet. There's something about both of them that are really just so good for the soul when you when you have them uh, and, and you take in, uh, you know, a, a regular amount of both. I mean, all your points were amazing, but we're talking through them. I mean, there's this link that links them all kind of together, which yes, for me is yes, just, yes. it's incredible. Well, in our last one, I'm going to take you out on a, I'm take you out a bit and I'm going to challenge you as I challenge myself all the time. So one of the things that I'm really obsessed over is the unconscious influence of diversity. So here's an example. I intentionally, when I had a foundation working with youth leaders, I had a German on my board, a guy from the Eastern Cape, Kosa speaker, Indian. But the point is that I had this diverse board and there are just certain things that happen and occur. And one of my mentors, his name is Renus LaRue, big Afrikaans guy, was in the military, but he's a genius. He's written like 20 books. But these people were able to provide insight to me that there was just no way for me to get. And I'm starting to really understand that social media is not interested in this. So algorithms are driven on a simple principle to lock you into the platform so it can sell to you. Mm. And so what it does is create echo chambers for you that trigger emotional engagement. Let me simplify that on how this plays out in your life and how everybody listening is probably a little guilty. So I'm on Netflix and I watch Dave Chappelle and then afterwards I watch Chris and I watch Chris Rock afterwards. I What's going to happen? I did exactly the same thing. I did exactly what you do, what you're saying now. You're talking to me. I did this last week. I watched them back to back. You're talking to okay. me. Have you, you, you been watching me? <laughs> <laughs> I told you we were going to be friends, right? <laughs> so what, what is the algorithm going to do after you and I watch Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock? And there's no coincidence that we did this. What the algorithm is going to do is start showing you Black comedians from America. Now, this is important. If I like Bill Burr, who happens to be a white comedian, then the algorithm is going to assume if I don't click on Bill Burr, it's going to start pouring me Black comedians from America. So if I want to keep, if I want to hack, I want to see and experience diverse comedians, I have to hack the system. So what I often do is I will choose and Google and search random comedians from different parts of the world, Indian, um, black, white, all types of people. And then I'll slide the viewer bar over just so it just starts to show me different people. Yes. I do the same thing on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, for example, if I speak at a conference and it happens to be mostly black, LinkedIn and then a few black people start to add me or a few white people start to add me from a conference where there's white people. What happens is it'll only start showing me those people. And so every so often, for example, recently I spoke at an Indian conference and it only started showing me Indian people. So I started just clicking on random white people so I could hack the system. <laughs> <laughs> and this is very important. Go, so I want to, as I close my seven tips, and I hope you guys found some value in this, I want you to go and look at the people you follow. And ask yourself, how much has the algorithm chosen these people for me? Mm. And how much are these people narrowing and putting me in an echo chamber that's isolating me from parts of the world? Mm. 
I do this with media. I watch Fox News and CNN. Yes. I look at and I download podcasts with differing views. Now, I have to warn you, this is going to take a bit of mental energy because it's going to challenge you. No one wants to be challenged. But if you want to succeed at a high level and you want your brain to be pumping at a level where you're going to be able to innovate and do amazing things, you've got to incorporate these hacking tips. And what I see over and over again, Right now, I'm working with a bank in the Middle East in Kuwait called Bobian. At the same time, I did a presentation recently at Capitec. Now, how can I balance my engagement with a Middle Eastern bank and a South African bank while also collaborating with my U.S. people? It's because I've created systems that open me up. And if you get stuck in an echo chamber, it is numbingly simple and pathetic. Absolutely. So challenge yourself. Amen, brother. Have fun with these tips, guys. I, you know, and that last tip, just to add on to that, you know, we, we find ourselves doing our, living our lives in these echo chambers, to your point. We, we, we socialize in these echo chambers. We go to, uh, along to functions. We travel the world. Uh, what do we do? We go, we go to Morocco. We find a beautiful beach in Israel. We go and, and we join another group of South Africans in their hotel bar <laughs> drinking. Instead of going to go and see what the locals do, we, we end up doing, the, you know, the, 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 the total opposite to what we really wanted to do. So to your point, I, I find myself when, when there's social gatherings on, uh, Timothy, and there's people congregating. I'd like to go and find interesting people in the room that I, I wouldn't normally go and talk to. I would normally go and find my own tribe, as it were, and go and stand yes. with my tribe of like-minded people, having the same conversations that I know uh, it's going to start and end exactly the same way as it does every single time this tribe gets together. And instead of going to do that thing with my tribe, I go, okay, listen, what am I going to take away from this encounter of people together? Let me go to the other side of the room. Let me go and talk to somebody I would never normally talk to who who, who may be a, a totally different intellect, who may be a totally, uh, have a total different vocation. Um, and I find it to be the most fascinating, challenging, uh, world-opening experience uh, because it opens up a, a world uh, to me that wouldn't normally exist and that I normally wouldn't have, have even ventured into. Um, but I forced myself away from what I would consider to be the norm uh, and to, 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 to create a different space uh, for me to be able to learn and grow. Can I just share with you quickly why it's hard to do what you did and why it's very difficult and why most people don't is that I write a lot about what I call the sameness effect and the, the beauty of sameness. Mm. Because to be honest with you, I'm tired of people preaching about diversity and inclusion without giving us the science of why it's so difficult. When I hear someone speak the same language, if I speak Afrikaans and I hear somebody else speaking Afrikaans, a huge chunk of my brain region starts to relax. I feel safe. Symbolically, I think I understand their values. And if we go through our evolutionary background and a lion was coming up to our camp in the bush, if I have to translate from Afrikaans to another language, I'm likely to get eaten alive. And so when you're around people with the same language, with the same symbolism, if I see someone wearing a burqa, or a kippah, a Jewish person, and I see that, there is an unconscious magnetic attraction to it. And this is very important mm. because diversity on the surface makes you vulnerable. It, it exposes you to extraordinary risk. And so you got to keep that in mind, mm. that you need sameness. And you need people. If I find a group of Americans playing basketball, there's something very cathartic about that for me. Mm. And if I have to go and force myself to play rugby or cricket with some, some guys yes. from uh, Stellenbosch, that's going to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not saying go and force yourself into it, but I'm saying yes. design it subtly, yes. like you said. Yeah. Design it subtly in a way where... You can catapult yourself in subtle ways. Yes. And so when I speak to my friend Renus, who is an African guy, or I speak to somebody who's German or Indian or whatever, I can't make that the majority of my life. Yeah. But I can weave it in yes. so it can complement me and help yes. boost my brain in ways that are delightful. You have been speaking a delightful, a delight to chat to on this podcast. I can see why um, you are um, as, as sought after in, in your field as you are. Uh, refreshing to chat to. Timothy, thanks for your time today. Thanks, Ryan. You're amazing. I appreciate it. 
Everybody, thanks for listening to us. This is Health Matters. I'm Ryan O'Connor in partnership with Sipla. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please remember to rate and review the show. And of course, we'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Health Matters in association with Sipla. Check your favorite podcast app for the latest episode.